go wow wow. Everybody doing okay this morning? Let me tell you what we're doing today. We're gonna have this discussion, and like I said earlier, it's not it's not graphic, but we need to talk about some things because I believe that this is one of the most uh, uh, life altering, changing areas of our lives. And so we're gonna talk about it. And I was thinking about this morning. I don't know how you start a sermon like this. I was in student ministry for years and years, so that was even more awkward. And we talked about it with with students. But I had a friend named Van Norman who is a uh, lives in a mobile, and he's a minister. And he called me probably 10 years ago, and he said, Hey, I, uh, I, had, I did a wedding today. I performed a wedding ceremony. I said, What's that all about? He said, I said, Why are you, Okay, why are you calling me? He said, Well, it was um, for this young man and this young woman who had never, they had never dated anybody besides each other. Uh, the extent of their physical interaction with each other is they had held hands before they got married. He said, so I'm standing there, and I pronounce them husband and wife, and I say, you may kiss your bride. And the guy goes, <laughs> and he said, I was like, just kiss her? And he said it was this major apprehension. And he, like, they leaned in. They both, like, leaned their heads left, you know, the under, you know you're supposed to lean. And it was, like, noses banging. And he said, and, and, it, and it was, you know, he said at some point, like, he took her shoulders but like not gently, like just grabbed her shoulders and like kissed her. And he said it was, it wasn't, it was, he said the only word, it was just awkward. He said, my wife and I went to the reception and we're driving home. And he said, uh, and Van said to his wife, he, was, he said, I don't mean to be graphic, but they're on their honeymoon and they have no clue. And his wife goes, and isn't that wonderful? And I thought about it and, and you know, I don't, I don't know but one story like that, that, I, that people have told me. There are probably more stories. But this idea that, you know, sex has is, is invaded our culture. I mean, you, you don't have to have your TV on. It doesn't have to be late at night for you to see things that make you cringe. That, I love that slide about, you know, the awkward, like, see a nudie scene with your parents kind of awkward. That no matter in our house when we're, you know, renting movies, no matter what, the movies are rated PG-13, there might be one little snippet of a bad thing. It's always the time your parents walk in. That's how it always happened in our house. Maybe the same at your house. But we're going to talk about this this morning because, honestly, growing up, uh, a lot of us, the talk that we had with our parents, if we had one, was pretty lame. Can I get an uh-huh on that? Uh, and we were talking to a band in the back, and um, nope, most of the folks in the back hadn't even had a discussion with their parents. We never had that discussion. Uh, I don't know if Blair did. Blair may have scared them. I don't know. Or Kim, maybe before you. I don't, we never, my parents never sat down with me and said, hey, here's just how this is. Here's why this is important. Here's why God gave this. And so it was kind of taboo, kind of off limits, kind of, which makes you just more interested, right? More curious about it. And so we want to talk about it because we can't assume that, that people talk about this stuff. We can't assume that everybody knows these things. This, this idea, this, this thing that God has given us. See, in our culture, there's a myth that sex is merely physical. Would y'all, would, has anybody ever heard that or felt that in, in culture before? I felt that before. And if that's the case, then, then sex really isn't any different than like ping pong or tackle football. You know, if it's just physical. You know, like tackle football, it's kind of like wrestling. No, it's not wrestling. It, it's, it's more than physical, and we all... We all know that. And, and, and the reality today, we're going to talk about this for a minute, but the reality is this, if you treat sex as if it's just physical, it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt you inside. We have all have seen people that, um, that have mistreated this gift God's given us, and they've been hurt by it. Some of you today, without putting all of your past up on a screen, would say today, you'd say, Matt, the most mistakes I've ever made in my life are in this area. The, the biggest regrets I have in my life are in... And this subject, this topic, this idea that, that, that sex is something God's given us and people mistreat it. You know, a lot of us have, have parents that maybe walk through an era where in the, in the, the 60s and the, the idea of free love, just be with whoever you want to be and, and give yourself away. We believe as Christians, we'll look at in a minute, that, that God gives us this idea, this purity. And you, when you give yourself away to a person, you, you give yourself away and then you give yourself away to another person that there's... Less and less of you. I want to tell you today, and at the end, we're going to pray. And one of the things I'm praying for you is that if you have never dealt with these, these ghosts of your sexual past, that maybe today, maybe today you can just can let go of them. Maybe you could today can let, let Christ come and wash you and clean you. And, and, and those words, that when, I, when I see him, I don't have time to maintain these regrets. I love the word maintain. 
See, see, all of us, if you're an adult today, the, the likelihood is you didn't walk into your marriage or your last long relationship pure. And, and that's true of all of us. Um, most of us. Maybe some of you did. Praise God if you did. But, but we have this baggage of what we did wrong. Because sex is not just a physical thing. I want to ask you some questions because I, I want to convey and help you see the gravity that maybe, maybe we have thought sex was just physical. I'm going to ask you some questions and you just think about them. Uh, first question, why is it, and this is, this is why we had kids leave the room, why is it that when a child is sexually abused when they're little and they become adult, they have a hard time shaking that off? You ever thought about that before? Um, I have met people before doing some counseling and, and ministry work that had been through some really bad things as a child, and they got older, and it was very apparent they had never dealt with it. Girls and guys, things that had happened to them that they had never dealt with. Why is it that when a lady is abused and raped, that there's a large percentage of them that never, ever even call the police? But when women are beaten up by a bad boyfriend or by somebody on the street trying to steal from them, almost 100% of those people make a phone call. It's because sex is more than just physical. It's, it's a spiritual, it's part, of, it's part of your soul. It affects more than just your physical outside body. Students today, I want you to, to hear this because you can, ha- you can keep yourself from lots and lots of harm if you'll just listen to this truth, that, that God has created this wonderful, amazing, awkward, unspoken of gift called sex that he's given us to be within the confines of marriage. You know, why is it that... that uh, that men with the deepest sexual issues, if you've done any counseling or read any books about pornography or different abuses, why is it that men with these deepest sexual issues usually have an uninvolved or missing father? I heard a, a prison chaplain one time say he would counsel men that had sexual issues, and he'd done it for 25, 26 years at, at the time of the interview, and he said, I've never interviewed a man that has these issues that had a dad that was around. Because it's more than just physical. It's more than just your outside body. It's more than just a man's parts and a lady's parts. It's something deep down in, inside of us. And why is it that most people's regrets are, are sexual? You know, if, if you came up to me today afterwards and maybe emailed me and you said, Matt, I've got a heavy regret that I need to talk to you about. And I've had that discussion lots of times. Teenagers, uh, adults, couples, single people, single again people, divorced people, people going through divorces. Never ever has that regret been, I was telling Blair this earlier, never ever has that regret been, hey, when I was 21, I backed my car into another car at the mall, and I didn't leave a note on the car. And I just have that regret. It just haunts me every day. Almost every single time, the regret involves something sexual, something where a person did something they shouldn't have done with a person that wasn't their spouse, and now it haunts them. A few years ago, I was kind of preaching the same message at a church, and we made a little video. It was kind of funny. We, we had a, it was a, the idea was a husband and wife going on their, their, their first night of their honeymoon, and they come into the, the, uh, the, the nice hotel suite, and they're sitting there on the bed, and it's awkward, and they're talking, and, and then like, the husband's about to like, kiss the wife, and there's a knock on the door. And it was his girlfriend from high school that came in that he had been intimate with. And so she sits on the bed. Like, hey, how y'all doing? And he's like, yeah, we're not so good now. And then, and then he's just like, I'm just going to ignore her. And, and she leans in maybe to take his hand. And, and there's a knock on the door, and it was her football player boyfriend in high school. And, and the, the, the skit, the joke of it is we bring all that stuff with us into our marriage, into our marriage beds. And if we don't deal with that and let go of that and teach our kids to not act that way and not to live that way, then we're going to have the next generation is going to be worse off than we are. How many of y'all have seen families that do that? That their kids repeat the same horrible things that the parents did? And we don't want that to be true of you. We want it to be, to be every generation to be a little bit, a little bit better. Let, let's imagine something. Imagine, I'm going to show you a picture. Imagine that I gave you, there's a picture of a car wheel. You see that? This is a, uh, I love this vehicle. Wes, this is for, for you this morning. This is a 67 Mustang Shelby GT500 Super Snake. This, is, this car was made once. Uh, it's a certain specific model, has a 427 cubic inch engine in it. It was made to test a certain kind of tire that Ford was using. Uh, the top speed on this car was 170 miles an hour. Now, I don't know, like I, I salivate looking at this car. Um, I like, I just get, that's really amazing to me. There's been one of them made. And let's say that for some reason that this had been a barn car, that my dad had this on his land, and we found it. It had been under a tarp. It had been not scratched. It had been taken care of. And I had this car. Let's say this is my personal vehicle. And I come in this morning, and I pull the keys out, and I say, is there a 16-year-old male in this room that would like to drive my car? 
And you go, I don't mean. And then maybe it's a little bit later, and Spencer's like, I'm 16, and I take my keys, and I flip them to Spencer. This, this one-of-a-kind, rare car. Sold at auction for $1.3 million a few years ago. Totally irreplaceable. You cannot replace this car. One. There's one made. The crew that put it together probably isn't even alive anymore. Put it together in 66, sold in 67. And I, and I flip the keys to Spencer. And I say, Spencer, when you get done, find somebody else that will drive it and throw the keys to them. And then if, y'all get done, if you get done with it in time... I live at 143 Lakeshore, just bring it by my house and, and leave the keys under the, the mat. Would anybody in their right mind do that? No, but anybody? No. Because that thing is precious and rare and irreplaceable. And, and people have a, a lot higher view of a car or a piece of art or a Stradivarius violin than we ever do about this precious gift that God has given us that is our sexuality, our purity that God has given us from the get-go. And we mistreat that and we honor things like this. And I just want you today to think about it. I want you to go, you know what, maybe, maybe I've just got this thing wrong. Maybe, maybe I've, I've forgotten that I can't be replaced. Maybe I've forgotten that I only have one life to live. See, the issue about this is not just sex. The issue is the word intimacy. You, know, you guys ever use the word intimacy? We don't say this word a lot. You know, we don't, we don't say intimacy. There's a, there's a definition I want to give you. Intimacy is to know and to be fully known. Intimacy is for you to know and for you to be fully known. And I want you to imagine today, maybe today, maybe you've never heard this before because I never heard it in church or from my parents, but maybe God gave us this gift. Maybe he gave us this wonderful, awkward thing called sex that none of us want to talk about. Maybe he gave it to us as a symbol, as a reminder of the way that he wants to know us. You know, a lot of us treat God with like the Heisman stiff arm or like a legal transaction or like you went to go visit a lawyer and I had some sins and he did some paperwork and they filed it with a judge and the judge said, okay, all is clean, now you're off and da 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 And maybe God says, maybe God wants to know us at a way deeper level than that stuff. Some of you today, we sing these songs and it says how he loves us and and heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss. You're like, what is that all about? It's about the idea that there's an almighty God that really wants to know you way more than you can even imagine. He wants to know you on levels you can't imagine. He wants to know you areas of your life that you can't imagine. And men, it's mostly us that struggle with this. We're not good with our emotions. You ever seen guys trying to say bye to each other? Like when a, after they've seen each other, like, hey, man, I love you, bro. And they do the like the tap, 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 which is like the I like girls. I am straight. You know, we do that because we're not really good with our emotions. I got a guy that is like, I love him like a brother. He's in Europe right now. And every time we see each other, it's like we're by, we're like, you really, you're really special with me. See you. Okay. And we, and we leave and I'll get, like a, a, I'll get like a funny card from him and he'll be like, you're one of my best friends in the world. No, really you are. It's never in person. We can't have this discussion. He may watch this video. Sorry, Brad. You know, whatever. But, but it's never us in person because us dudes, we're like, we, we feel like it's weak to show that silence. I just want to tell you something today. Men, God wants to know you at that level. God wants to know you at the places where you're scared for anybody to see you, the things you're not even okay telling your wife. God wants you to fully know you. Ladies, same thing. God wants to know you, and God gives us this, this gift of sex between married people so that we can go, you know, this is a reminder, a symbol of the way God loves us. That's why we crave it. We're hardwired deep down inside to want this intimacy, this high level of knowledge, of experience with a person. See, see, God created sex. He, it's like he's in heaven because I have a great idea. Imagine this. I have a great idea. God could have, we could have all been born from pellets. Just add water, boop, people, babies. But no, he said, let's just, let's make it like really crazy and intricate and like parts fitting and wrapping. And let's do this. And then it, they'll have to look at each other to do this and be eye to eye. And it's like you can't, be, you can't be naked and have pride. So let's just do all this and put it in there together. And then, and then he gave it to all the animals. And so like rabbits have it and, and horses and donkeys and cats and dogs. And some of y'all learned about sex that way. You're like, the dogs are at it again or the dog thinks I'm his girlfriend, you know, whatever your dog did. And God says, now I'm going to give it to all the animals, but I'm going to make it even better. I'm going to raise the standard, and I'm going to give it to people, but I'm going to make it even better with people. I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it this intimate thing where their hearts are shared, where they, where they share their souls with each other. They connect on a level that's way beyond anything, anything physical. See, maybe God gave us something that he wants to reflect what he wants to give us 
No fear of comparison, no holding back. No, it's fragile, it's powerful, and it's a gift to all of us. See, you and I all know people in this room who have mistreated this thing and they're numb to it. They're numb to it. Ladies, you all have a friend, or you are the friend, that would say this. I didn't, I didn't take care of myself before I was married, and now I have a really hard time connecting with my husband. We, we all have known those people. So, so today I, w- I want to talk about this because I believe that the world has set a pattern in place that's really incorrect. The world has said to you, it's just physical. Connect with as many people as you want. It's, not, uh, it's nothing but just uh, sheer biology. It's not your heart. It's just, it's just bodies getting together. And, and this is not a new issue. Paul, the apostle Paul we've been talking about for a while, 2,000 years ago was talking to a church that had the same issue. Now, I want to to tell you a couple things about this church. I wrote some notes down because it's pretty interesting. Um, The Greeks, this church in Corinth, they had this Greek philosophy. They believed that anything physical was basically evil and had no value to it. And so here's what it came out. They said what was done with or to the body did not matter. So basically it was like go crazy. It's just your body. Food was food, the stomach was the stomach, and sex was sex. They literally taught that it was just a biological function. So if you need to go to the bathroom every day, it's okay. You need to eat every day. You need to go have sex every day. They literally taught that. They encouraged in their, their worship of false gods, they encouraged men and women, or men explicitly, to go down to the temple and have sex with, with these temple prostitutes. It was part of the fake religion that they had. It was encouraged, and it was not a big thing. It was not people coming together. It was just something you did. It's like you sweat, you run, you have sex. It's just one of those things you did. It was just a physical, no spiritual thing. But the problem is we've seen that in our culture, and we've seen people broken from it. We've seen people's hearts that are broken. And so Paul enters the scene 2,000 years ago saying the same truth that we're trying to tell you today. It was so bad that the idea of being sexually promiscuous was called Corinthianizing. They made a word out of it. You're pretty bad. When a deviant sexual act is named after you, okay? And these people that Paul's talking to, they were such bad people that literally they had it named after them. So I want us to look over Paul's shoulder as he's writing to these people, and I want you to look at the words he says to them as it applies to us. In 1 Corinthians 6, 16, it says this, Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? This is new to them. This is not modern belief at the time. This was a radical thing. There's like, you mean the temple prostitutes become one? No, it's just something you do. And he says further, for as it is written, the two will become one flesh. That's a reference back to Genesis about God creating man and woman for each other. Let's keep going. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So it's us as believers. This means Don't go weird with this. This means when we engage in things, good things or bad things, we're bringing Jesus with us. Now, I used to ask teenagers, they were like, how far is too far? I'm like, what would you do if your grandma was sitting with you? Like, oh, that's gross. Then you're doing too much. Granny can't watch, doing too much. Okay? Now, this goes further and says, if we're with Jesus and he is a part of us, go to verse 18. And it says, flee from sexual immorality. It doesn't say stand and fight. It doesn't say, you know, be strong. It says flee. It means run. Specifically in the Bible, whenever sexual sin comes up, it always tells us to run. You know why it says that? Because we can't win this. Can somebody just grunt and say, uh-huh? We can't win this. We're not going to win this. We're not going to stand and fight because we all have these desires that are God-given, perverted by our, our enemy in this world. And so it says, every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. All this discussion about whether sex outside of marriage is right or wrong, it says right there it's sin. It's just sin. And it's not that God wants to keep us from joy or keep us from exciting things. He wants to protect us. It'd be like if I lived on a major highway and I didn't put a fence up for Hudson. I would be an evil father not to protect him from harm. But one day, Hudson, you'll be old enough you can drive out there, but now we're going to hang out behind these fences because that's what's safe for you. These rules that God has given us, they're not, they're not trying to put down our freedom. It's trying to give us safety and protection from something that we're not ready for. Yet, students, listen to this. Get this in your heart. Verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Not, not going down to the temple, but you yourself are the temple within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. Verse 20, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. 
See, every one of you today has been bought. Every one of us today has been redeemed or have the opportunity to be redeemed, but Christ has died to give you the opportunity to know him. I want want to give you some things. If you said, Matt, how do I honor God with my body? Now, this applies if you're a single person or a married person or if you're a student. Wherever you are, this applies to you because it says we were bought with a price. First thing is this. First thing I want you to do is to, to delight yourself in Jesus and his gift for you. I want you to write this down. You've got this on the back of your notes. The first thing we need to do is to delight ourselves in Jesus because here's the deal. Unless you realize he is better, you will fail at this. Unless you realize you will not win just living by, I'm just going to keep some rules. I'm just going to, I'm going to be pure, but if you don't have any prize that's better than the, the, the temptation in front of you, you will fail at this. You will not just be a moral person. You will fail at this. You will not succeed at keeping yourself honorable to God. I want to, get, I want to share some verses with you. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you're a believer today, this is what Christ calls us to. Not to live your life your way, but to say, this is Christ living out my life. How would Christ live out my life? That changes a lot of things that we might do. How would Christ honor my marriage? How would would Christ have me date girls or date young men? How would Christ have me speak? How would Christ have me look at things on the internet or what movies to watch? What would Christ have me to do? Galatians 2.20. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he, God, made him to be sin as Jesus who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. The reality, the truth today is that the gospel says to you that you and I are far from God. But Jesus came through the heavens and came through time and put on flesh and saved us and died in our place even when we hated God. Even when we stood against all that was good and holy, we said no, and we gave God the bird and said, I don't need you. Jesus said, you don't even know what you're saying. I'll die in your place. And when you realize that truth and you realize what he did, then you go, maybe I can, maybe I can pursue him because that message and what he did is way better than this, this momentary, fleeting thing that makes me feel good for a moment. You will never be pure and honor him until you go, but he's just better It doesn't mean you're not going to be lonely or have temptations or feelings or emotions, but you're just going to say, you know what? It's not the right moment. I'm not married yet. I need to keep myself pure. If you're a man and you are married or a lady and you're married, you go, I've got to honor my marriage because this is what he did. He bought this thing for me. The gospel says that that we can deny this world and say yes to him because he's just better. And many of you today, you haven't gotten to where you think he's better. He's just part of who you are, and he's not all that you are. I want to tell you today, he loves us. He has sought us out. He's jealous for us. He's not just a part of your life. You just don't go to church on Sundays. He is our lives. And I just want you to get that. This next verse is about the gift. And in Proverbs it says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. This is to men, to married men. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. And then it says, Be intoxicated always in her love. That's what God tells us married men to think about our wives. Like a fine wine. To be intoxicated with it. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? In other words, I have something way more better for you in marriage than anything outside of it. Some of you today are like, Matt, I don't even know what that means. We need to pray that God will give that to you. That you'll have intimacy, not just physical interaction, but you'll be able to speak and share and, and have, have your hearts clicking together. The second thing I would tell you to, to be honoring God with your body is to run from sexual temptation. Run from it. Don't, don't think you're going to fight it. Be like Potiphar. Run. The Bible, there's a story of Potiphar being basically uh, pro- this propositioned by his boss's wife, and he says he runs. Some, some people believe that, he was, that she grabbed his garment, and he literally like stripped out of it and ran away from her. Naked, embarrassed, but i got to get away from her. This is what God tells us. Men, today, you're not going to win the fight against this temptation unless you just run. Especially us. Ladies, same thing. How you do that? Number one, you cry out to God for help. You say, God, help me. Today, some of you are just intertwined with this sin that corrupts you and drags you down and keeps you from being with your wife or your husband like you need to. I would just tell you this. Today, cry out and say this. I cry aloud to God. Aloud to God, he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. Unless God alone hears my cry. Some of you today, when we say our closing prayer, you need to say, God, help me. Help me. I've made horrible mistakes. 
I have brought baggage into my marriage. And you need to cry out to God and say, God, help me today. And he will help you. But you've got to cry out to him. He's offered it. He has said, I will help you. I will clean you. I will make you new. But you've got to cry out and say, God, I need you. I think a lot of times God sits back and says, I'm just going to wait till you need me. I'm here. I'm totally here. I'm within an instant. But I, got to, I want to hear that you know that you need me. Sometimes you got to get to the end of your rope before he'll answer. And you got to be willing to admit you're there. How else do you do this? You find accountability. Accountability is not you sitting across breakfast and somebody says, yeah, you're awesome. Yeah, you're awesome too. We're awesome together. Accountability is somebody that looks at you and says, because I love you, i got to tell you something. You're not doing this right. You're, you're not doing, this is not a good way for you to go. And I care enough about you to tell you this. And Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. And the last thing I would tell you about that is to make it a really practical fight. Men, if you struggle with the internet stuff, there's all kinds of uh, internet plugins. TripleXChurch.com has some stuff. If you can't help but, but watch bad things, cut the, t- cut the cable off. Uh, if, you can't, if you can't handle being in a relationship with somebody that, that at work that's kind of inappropriate to you, get out of that. Quit that job. You're like, that's, that's serious. You, you got you to you you fight this. The story I love is Billy Graham goes into a hotel room. He always requested that TVs would be removed because he just had, had to keep his purity for his ministry. And he knew this. And uh, he walked into this room, and the TV was hardwired into the wall. And they said, you know, Reverend Graham, we couldn't remove it, but it's okay, and it, no big deal. And he said, it's, I want the TV removed. They said, well, sir, they're hardwired into the sheetrock, and we do that so people wouldn't, wouldn't steal them. And, and true story, Billy Graham, this is probably 20 years ago, threw his old leg up on the wall and grabbed that TV and pulled it off, and the, the, the power cord started popping up sheetrock up the wall. And he said that he was like, like a fishing line. They got to the top, and he tugged it and kind of, kind of shredded the wire, and sparks flew. And they were like, well, you don't have to pay for that. He said, I can pay for a TV and wire and sheetrock any day. I just can't pay for my purity. And for you and I, we got to make it practical. we got to say, for Jamie and I, it means that if you're a lady and you come by my house to drop off dinner, you can't come in unless my wife's home. Sorry. You're not welcome in my house unless my wife's there. You, you don't ever see me riding in a car with anybody that's a lady that's not my wife. It's a practical fight. If somebody said, I saw you with a girl that wasn't your wife. No, you didn't. Well, I didn't even tell you when it was. It doesn't matter because it doesn't happen. It's a practical fight. I'll bet you in my house that didn't happen. It's just a rule in our house. Make it practical. Decide beforehand, you are going to be a pure person. You're not going to dishonor God by the way you act. It's a hard thing. It's difficult. Find a, find a buddy you can give all your passwords to your internet stuff and say, hey, if I've cleared out the history, I need you to check me on it. Is that awkward? Yeah, but it's worthwhile. God's worthy of this. You know, at our house, we have, we have channels turned off. I don't even want to see the titles. Jamie's got the code. That's what we do at our house. Make it a practical fight. The third thing I would tell you to do this morning is to reset your mind and to serve. To reset your mind. The Bible says uh, in Romans 12 that do not be conformed to this world. And one version says to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. See the most powerful sexual organ you have is your brain. The, the thing that's going to determine your desires is what you put into your mind. And a lot of us, because of TV and Internet and magazines and advertising, we have filled our brains with things that aren't God's truth. And we're just chock full of it. We don't even know it. It's just in us. And I would tell you today, some of us need to reset. Some of you spend like 10 minutes a week reading the Bible and hours and hours of TV. And you're like, and I don't know why I'm not close to God because you don't know him. You don't know what he says. You don't know his words. You don't know his heart. You don't know his character. You don't know his integrity. You don't know his, his history. And I would just tell you today to, to go ahead and figure out a way to reset. And not just reset your mind, but take that new identity and do something with it. Quit just dating the church. Quit just consuming. Decide to be a part of the solution. Be, decide to be a part of what God's doing. Be, be a servant. Find something to do and to serve. In Psalm 119, it says, I've stood up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You kind of do the flip of that verse. And if you said, I have not stored up your word in my heart, and I will sin against you. If you're not storing up God's word, you are not going to be a holy and pure person. You're not going to be equipped to do that. And then Hebrews 4, it says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So here's some things you need to do with Scripture. You need to pray Scripture. You need to pray it. You need to say, God, I know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. You need to find a verse and pray through it. 
You know, when you're anxious, I, I pray this all the time, God, help me not to be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and petition to present my request to you and, and, and have the peace of Christ guard my heart and mind. You need to find that scripture and incorporate it in your prayers. If it's, if it's a matter of you putting unholy things, and you need to find that verse in Ephesians that says, whatever is good and noble and pure and right, dwell on these type things. Find something to go on the offensive. Don't just sit there and be a victim about this stuff. Go on the offensive. Pray it. You need to read Scripture. Some of you don't even read any Bible. And we always talk about this. You may be a new believer or, or even considering this. Read the Bible. Find out what God says about himself. It's wonderful. God will change your life. You don't need me. You don't need this band. You don't need this little church. But God will speak to you straight through his word. If you don't want to be changed, don't read it. But if you do, if you're open, if you're willing to let God speak to you, read it. See what he's got to say. You need to memorize scripture. Oh, I can't memorize scripture. But you can memorize lyrics or stupid movie quotes. All kinds of stupid. I, I knew somebody that could quote like almost all of Dumb and Dumber, but he wouldn't memorize scripture. Like, you're an idiot. Dumb and Dumber? Really? That's like prime real estate space in your brain? Find, find a little scripture and memorize it. You know, I, I don't know what your challenge is. If you've been done through a lot of things in the past you regret, you need to memorize that scripture that says, if anybody's in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The oldest past, the newest come. What a wonderful thing. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If I'm in Christ, I'm a new creation. The old things have passed, the new things have come. And that way, when, when something comes on TV, you're like, I don't want to look at that. You go, no, but I'm a new creation. That's past. I'm a new God. I don't have to look at that mess. I'm free from that because the old things have passed, the new things have come. Memorize it. Get it in your heart so that at the moment you need it, you can take a withdrawal and say, hey, I'm going to play this card. I'm going to play the 2 Corinthians 5, 17 card on that. It's not going to occupy my time because I'm a new person. I'm a new creation. The old things have passed. The new things have come. you got to have it in you to do that. You need to meditate on Scripture. That means you need to think about it, dwell on it, write on an index card, put it on your mirror, put it where you brush your teeth, put it where you drive your car, meditate on it, chew on it, think about it. And the last thing is you need to wrestle with Scripture. You need to wrestle with Scripture. What, is this, what does God want me to do today? Our goal at Catalyst is not just to have a lot of people here. We want to have people here that are hearing the word of God and they're changing. That word catalyst means something that, in, that makes change happen. We want to help you be a further along with your walk with Jesus because you've been here because you're changing. You've got to wrestle with Scripture. The last, the last thing today to honor God with your body is this, and it's, it's just kind of the meat of everything. We want you to serve your spouse. Now, just to be honest, we had just a moment of honesty. How many of y'all just find this naturally easy? Anybody? I'm going to put my hand down because it seems like I'm implying I can. This is not easy. This is countercultural. It's counter natural. It's not what you, it's not your default. Your default is to be served. Like, I love to be served. Like, I like for you to bring me things and do what I want, and it's all about me, and it's like I'm the center of my universe. I'm the sun, and you can orbit around me, and if I've had a bad day, you better just know it. Like, at our house, I get in trouble because I won't tell Jamie things. I'm like, and you should know me better, woman. No, I don't say that, but you should <laughs> make me some pot. No, I don't say that. I, 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 in my mind, I almost get mad or you should understand me better. How, how dare me have to tell you that I have a meeting on Thursday at 4 in the afternoon? Well, you should just, I mean, I know that's, like, ridiculous, but we do that because we don't, we don't decide to serve. We decide to be served. And so I want you, if you're a married person, and if you're not married, I want you to take some notes because one day maybe you will get married. You'll be a better spouse because of this. I want you to think about this. I want you to serve your spouse. Number one, I want you to kill any and all heart distractions. Any and all heart distractions. And you go, what is that? That's the thing that you wouldn't do if your spouse was around. That's the way you talk or act or the thing you look at. If your wife or husband was sitting there with you that you wouldn't do. In Proverbs 4, there's this verse that I love, and it says, Above all things... Guard your hearts, for it is the wellspring of life, for everything you do flows from it. Different versions have a little different wording. For years, I taught this verse to students, and I taught it from this theological movie called Bambi. And there's this theological term. It's not Greek or Hebrew. It's a, it's a Disney word. They made it up. It's called Twitter Patient. Remember the little scene where the animals are talking, and, it's, and they've all gone through, like, little animal puberty, and they're like, hello, Bambi. You know, Thumper's little voice has changed, and he's like, they're all, like, you know, 13-year-old, in human years, animals. And they're like, we're going to stick together and be best friends. And the story basically goes where they all get distracted, like a little pretty deer, a little girl deer walks by, and Bambi's like, Noop! you know, and he gets his, his eyes on her. And, and I would teach that this movie depicts really what our struggle is. We get highly distracted because we get Twitter-pated was the word we used. 
And I just want to tell you this, the, the, the Hebrew word for guard your heart, it literally is a, is a warfare word. It means to build a moat around your castle of treasure and build inner walls and, and put everything you can to keep the danger away from the treasure. I want you to get this. Do everything in your power to keep the danger away from the treasure. And the treasure would be like after the moat and the drop-down bridge and the, the, the gate with the iron and the flaming oil and the arrows and the inner court. And then you have the tower that had the spiral staircase and the door with the heavy lock. This is what God's telling us to do with our hearts. Guard it above all things. Above all things. So for you today and for me today, we've got to look at anything that would disrupt our hearts and we've got to kill it. You've got to mercilessly kill it. That means you may need to end some friendships. There may be some inappropriate conversations you've had. You've got to say this, I am going to guard my heart. And it's awkward and hard and difficult and makes things strange sometimes. Meg and I have never had our worship planning by ourselves. We've had when Wes is out of town, we're like, Hey, Megan, who can we call to come be with us at Starbucks? And it's really awkward because we don't, I mean, there's some people like, I don't even understand worship. We're like, come sit with us. Christy Curry, you've been there before. You've sat with us before. It's just a weird kind of thing. But you know why we do that? Because I love Megan and Stephen enough to honor their marriage. And Megan loves me and Jamie enough to honor our marriage. And so we honor each other that way by saying we're going to guard our hearts, even in a simple friendship the way it looks to the world. Above all things, guard your heart. Above all things. I had a pastor one time that said, Hey, would you take my teenage daughter home? She lived a, he lived a mile and a half from the church. I said, no, sir, I can't. He goes, why not? He said, because I don't take young ladies in my car. He goes, it's only a mile and a half. I said, then fire me. I'm not taking your daughter home. What do you have going on? I said, absolutely nothing. I would rather her walk and me follow her in my car, which would be a funny picture. You know, above all things, guard your heart. Second thing is this, and this is really fun for all of us. Husbands and wives, quit being selfish. Quit being selfish. Now, men, this is probably going to be your favorite verse in the whole Bible that I'm about to share with you. Uh, my wife's not here, so can, Michelle, can you relay this verse to my wife? Like put it on a T-shirt for her maybe. But here's what it says. Uh, this is God's word. The Lord has spoken. It says, the, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband in the same way the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. This is the verse that we all the men are like, praise God for the word of God. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I know a couple that the wife, when the husband doesn't act like she wants him to, she punishes him by withdrawing herself from him. And I don't mean to be funny. That's evil. That's against God's word. Men and women today, serve your spouse. Make it so that your spouse would never look anywhere else for that intimacy because they're getting it from you. Make it so that, that your wife or your husband says, I am loved totally at home in every way. I'm taken care of. And I can't even imagine going anywhere else because that is second rate compared to what I have at home. That doesn't just mean being in the bedroom. It means wooing and romancing your husband and your wife, doing things that make them smile, They'll find out their love language, love them as they need to be loved, but quit being selfish. This isn't just a birthday thing, folks. If my husband had a long day, I guess I need to go home and take care of him. Shame on you if you act that way. This is what God has given us. It's a reflection of him. This is a beautiful picture of the way he loves us. Quit being selfish. And the last thing is we need to reflect Jesus and the love he has for his church and our marriages. If somebody looks at you and they don't see this really awesome, passionate marriage, you need to pray and seek God and say, help, help our marriage be a picture of the church. I want to read you the scripture. It's going to take you a second because it's, it's some good stuff. Let's go through it together. Ephesians 5 and we're done. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now we can talk about this later on. If you get offended by this, you're gonna, it'll make sense just a second. 24. Now as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. You know what this means? Christ protects and cares for and loves and dies for his church. Ladies, God's calling you to serve a husband who's called to do all those things for you. And men, if we start doing these things, I bet our, our ladies, our wives, will not have much problem submitting to that. 
The problem is we go, we don't do the loving and caring and protecting and dying for, and we just become stubborn and hard-headed and go, the Bible says for you to submit to me, and we're ignoring our role of protection and caring and dying, all those things. And God says, husbands do this, wives do this, it'll work out fine. And here's why. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. 27, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one who ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. This is the last part. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Sex isn't just physical. It's not just physical. It's this beautiful, emotional, spiritual thing God has given us for the confines of marriage that people abuse outside of marriage, and they hook up with people, and they dilute themselves, and they go, my heart is broken. I don't know why. I had a conversation with a young man last week who had been intimate with a girl, and they broke up, and he says, I feel like I'm going through a divorce. You know what? Because he is. Biblically, they're married in their hearts. And he's so heartbroken. I don't want my life, I don't even want my life to continue. And he really feels that way because he gave away this purity thing that God gave him. I just want to tell you today, if that's you, ask God to forgive you, make you clean. But from this day forward, honor God with your body. Honor God with your sexual life. Honor God in your marriage. Pray for God to give you intimacy and passion and all those things that will make your marriage better. Here's how we're going to finish. This is the challenge. This is a highly spiritual challenge. This week, two times a day, married couples, I want you at least twice a day to kiss your spouse. And I want each time you kiss them to be 15 seconds. 15 seconds is a long time, by the way. As you get older, you know, Jamie and I, when we were dating, we were like, kiss at stop signs. Like, I'd be like, let's go find a neighborhood with lots of short streets. That was kind of how I'm wired. As you get older, you're like, you get busy and... I'll kiss you tomorrow, you know, or, or whatever. You get distracted. You're like, my breath smells like I've been eating a dead deer, you know, or whatever. You know, in the morning, you're like, I've seen you in the morning. Go gargle boiling Listerine, or, you know, and, and we lose all that. But I want to tell you for this week, married people, not dating people. This would be a bad thing for dating people. Married people, for twice a day, 15 seconds. Now, 15 seconds, let's count it Mississippi together. One, Mississippi, two, Mississippi, three. It's a long time. Four, Mississippi. Five, you're third of the way there. Six, Mississippi. Seven, Mississippi. Eight, it's going to be awesome. Nine, Mississippi. Ten, guys like, woohoo! hoo 11, Mississippi. 12, Mississippi. Got three more. 13, Mississippi. 14, Mississippi. Fifth, let me tell you what's going to, not to be crude, a lot of the guys are going to be like, let's go in this room. 14, Mississippi. 15, Mississippi. <laughs> Praise God for bad Andrew speaking truth. Let me tell you what we're going to do with this. There's a, a pastor that challenged his whole church he said, Ed Young in Texas said he, he told every married couple in the church if they were able to for 30 days to have sex every day. And the women were like, that's a long time. And the guys were like, praise God for Ed Young. You know? But I want to tell you this today. Some of you are not anywhere God wants you to be in your relationship, and there's wonderful, wonderful things out there for you. And I want to tell you this. Whatever it looks like in your marriage, because it looks like in different marriages, do something this week to go a little further with your spouse. Have that discussion of, hey, you know what really scares me in life? And tell them, they probably know, but it's really good for you to admit it. Hey, you know what my biggest dream is in life? Tell them. You know what I really love for our kids? Tell them, speak those things that aren't always on the surface and let God kind of draw your hearts together. You'll want, it'll be a wonderful week, I promise. It's a gift that God's given us. For you single folks, I'll tell you this, pray that God brings you the right person because sex inside of marriage is awesome. It's wonderful. Outside of marriage, it's not. It's depressing and down. It makes you feel bad and guilty. But inside me, I had an old preacher friend I asked. I was like, hey, what, what's allowed for people in marriage? He's like, I don't care. Knock yourselves out go crazy. This old 90-year-old dude, whatever you want to do, you're married. I'm like, okay. I'll just say this today. This is a gift God's given us. It's a gift. The world should look at Christians and say, man, they've got it better than we have it. Amen? And pray for us. Father, thank you for, uh, for truth. Thank you for scripture. Thank you that it says that um, we are to honor you with our bodies. And you have uh, given us this example of Jesus, the way he loved the church. And, Father, I know deep down you want to love us at levels that we don't even understand. God, you, you want to know. You want us to admit the things that are the deep, dark parts of our heart. You know all of them, but you want us to join in communicating that. And so, Father, I pray for husbands and wives this week. God, I pray they'd take this little goofy challenge for real. They'd Twice a day for the next week, they'd find a time to kiss for 15 seconds. 
and, and just to laugh and maybe giggle and enjoy that. But, Father, I pray that it would lead to us just enjoying our spouses and enjoying our marriages and, and God, and just thanking you for that. It's not taboo. It's not wrong. It's a wonderful thing. And so, God, I pray for our single folks. You help them be pure. I pray you'd help them keep their hearts in line with you. I pray you'd keep their eyes from anything that's negative. God, I pray for our students, our young women, our young men. You'd keep them just on track with you. I pray they delight in you, looking forward to the day when you'd bring them their spouse. And, um, God, it's so good to, to be in your word. I thank you that it covers all the things we need. And I, I pray you just bless, bless us as we go, as we hear, finish up these announcements. In Jesus' name, amen.